G'day, I'm James, and today I have some mathematical questions about piles of cards. Here's my first question. Take a pile of 52 cards and shuffle them, completely shuffle them up in a very good, careful way, unlike me right now, and then split them into two piles of exactly 26 cards each, like I just did there. All right, so my question is, do you think it's possible for me to find a red card in one pile and a black card in the other and be able to take them out? And surely the answer to that is yes, because I think if they're well shuffled, there's probably lots of red and black cards in there, lots of red and black cards there, just take out a red from there and a black from there maybe, great task done. Even my shuffling was remarkably uncareful, and this was nothing about black cards, this was nothing about the red cards, even then I can still take out a red card and a black card, one from each pile. In fact, to see what we've got here, can I do it right away? Uh, oh yes, definitely, I can take this black card out from this pile, this red card from that pile, task done. But actually, let's make this question a little deeper. Could I do it again? Well, clearly I could do it again right here. This is the second time I've done it. In fact, I can see I can do it a third time. Uh, I'd probably do it a fourth time. Yes, I can do it a fourth time. Do you think I can keep doing this 26 times in a row? Take out a red card from one part and a black card from the other? Hmm. Okay, let's make matters worse. This time, let's go for four piles of 13 cards each. And instead of going for red cards and black cards, let me now go for suits. I want one heart, one diamond, one club, and one spade, each coming from separate piles. Can I do it? Well, I look at this and see in this example, yes, I can choose the heart from there, maybe, and maybe choose the club from there, uh, maybe choose the spades from here, and choose the diamonds from there. Great, one card of each suit coming from separate piles. Brilliant, I did it, I lucked out. So my question is, Will I always be able to do that? And if I can always do that, could I do that 13 times in a row? Keep taking out one card of each suit from separate piles? Hmm. Okay, let's make matters worse still. Instead of going for colours, two colours, or suits, four suits, let's now go for the 13 numbers. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, kings. Can I, when I separate my shuffled deck of cards into 13 piles of four cards each, is it possible for me to find an ace in one pile, a two in a second pile, a three in a third pile, all the way up to a king in a 13th pile? Can I pull out one card of each number from separate piles? And now this is looking tricky. In fact, you might want to pause this video right now and just stare at the picture. Can you find some that work, the, work correctly here? And then you know what my next question is going to be. If you did it once, could you do it a second time? If you did it a second time, could you do it a third time? And if you did it a third time, could you also do it a fourth time? Could we do this four times in a row? Pull out one card of each number from separate piles? Wow, that would be amazing. All right, let's analyze what's going on. Let's go back to the very first case I presented, which was just two piles of 26 cards, where we seek one red card and one black card from the two separate piles. Okay, to get some mathematics going, let me see how to sort of formulate this in some sort of table, some sort of structure here. So we've got two piles, I'll have a pile one and pile two. Each pile is 26 cards, there'll be 26 cards in this pile, and there'll be 26 cards in that pile. That's the full 52 cards in the deck. And among these two piles are distributed red cards, and black cards. In fact, I know in a deck of cards there are 26 red cards and 26 black cards. Very handy, because once I know what's going on in one pile for one colour, I bet I know the rest of this table. For example, suppose it turns out there are, say, 12 red cards in pile one. Well, I know there's meant to be 26 red cards in all, so the missing 14 red cards must be over here in pile two. But pile 2 is meant to have 26 cards in total. Oh, so the other 12 cards in pile 2 must be black cards. But there are 26 black cards in total. Oh, so the remaining 14 black cards must be over here in pile 1. And look, pile 1 does actually add up to 26 cards. 
Beautiful. So actually the structure of what's going on in, a two by two, in this two by two case, two paths, three, six cards, two colors, must be a set of numbers like the following. In which case, I know exactly what to do to solve this puzzle. I can see from the table, oh, take a red card here and a red card from here, a black card from here. So one less, one less. That gets me down to what, 11 and 11. Bingo, done. Then I can do it again. Take a red card from here and a black card from here. Get me down to 10 and 10. Do it again, do it again. I can do it 12 times in a row and take out all the red cards from here, all the black cards from there. I've done it 12 times in a row, but I can keep going. Take a red card from here and a black card from here. Separate piles, bingo, do that 14 times in a row. And so I've taken all the cards out from my piles and there's no cards left. So I can indeed do it 26 times in a row. In fact, in general, you see no matter how the cards are distributed, if I have a cards here, I'll have B cards there, where B is the rest of the number to get me up to 26. It'll be what, 26 minus A. In which case, you can argue that's going to, have to be A as well, and B, and B cards there. In which case, I know exactly what to do. Take out A red cards in pile one, and A black cards in pile two, and then take out B black cards in pile one, and B black red cards in pile two, and bingo, you have completed this task 26 times in a row. The two by two case, the two pile case, is actually evident and clear. So what gets trickier now is to go up in number of piles, number four, number 13 piles, and so on. So let's do the four pile case next. Okay, let's then examine the case of four piles of cards. 13 cards per pile, and this time we seek one of each suit. Okay, grand. So it could be in a situation like this this time. We've well, got four piles, each with 13 cards. Uh, so that's up to 13, adds up to 13, 13, 13, 13. Okay, so each column adds up to 13 as it should, 13 cards per pile. And we have all the different suits distributed amongst those four piles. In fact, there are 13 spades. And indeed, my numbers on that row add up to 13. 13 hearts, 13 diamonds, 13 clubs. Oh, when you start arranging these, array, they have these tables, you'll notice they have some lovely structure. They're what people call semi-magic squares. Now you've probably heard of a magic square where every row and every column and every diagonal adds up to the same number. Here we have every row adds up to the same number, namely 13. Every column adds up to the same number, namely 13. But the diagonals are off. So it's only semi-magic. has rows and columns adding up to the same number. In this case, that magic number is 13. All right, so that's lovely. So it's got some structure here. Uh, okay, but what's our task? What's our task? Our task is to select one card of each suit from separate piles. So that means I need to do essentially the following. I need to figure out how to fight, choose a spade, choose a heart, choose a diamond, a club, one from each pile. I can kind of see what to do right now. I can choose something from there, a, heart, a spade from there, a heart from there, maybe choose a diamond from there, and a club from there. Because what I'll do then is I'll choose um, a spade from pile three, a heart from uh, pile one, a, a diamond from pile four, and a club from pile, pile two. Bingo. Each four piles used, each, each suit is selected, one from each pile, one of each suit. Brilliant. So actually, you can see what my real task is. I've got this semi-magic square, Every row, every column adds up to 13, and I have to select four non-zero numbers. One from each row, one from each column. Because once I've done that, what I can do is select one of these cards here, beautiful, make that one less. Select this heart from here, beautiful, but make that one less. Select a diamond from here, that'll be one less in pile three. And select a club here, that's in one less uh, club in pile two. And look what happens. What I've got now is another semi-magic square. Each row went down one value. Each column went down in one value. Every row and column now adds up to 12. If I can then circle another four non-zero numbers, one per row, one per column, for the semi-magic square of, of magic sum 12, then I can do the task again. In fact, the numbers I've circled work already. I can take up another spade from there, go down to zero, another heart from here, zero, another uh, diamond from here, down to seven, another club from here, down to two. And now I've got a semi-magic square of magic sum 10. No, 11. 11, yes, 11, because I've only done it twice so far. But if I do it a third time, Oh, I can't use these numbers. I've got some zeros now. So my task is, if I could prove that if every semi-magic square, no matter its sum, has four non-zero numbers, one per row, one per column, and then my, then my task would be done. And that means I'll get a new semi-magic square and I could do it again and again and again. So not only could I do it once, it means I could do it over and over again until I get nothing but zeros. All right, so to hear the challenge, it's really a theorem about semi-magic squares. We have to prove, given any semi-magic square of numbers, all rows, all columns, add to some, some, some common value, that I can always select four non-zero values, one per row, one per column. That's the mathematics I need to prove. So I'm going to do that, but let me um, get rid of the, the peripheral stuff here, because it's really a statement about semi-magic squares. Let me get the original numbers back here. 
And let me show you how my brain went about trying to understand why that claim I just made is actually true. Uh, this number was what? What was this? Uh, that's a, it was a two, that was a two, uh, that's a nine, and this must be a four. Everything 13? 13. There's the original number. All right, all right, so here goes. I've got to prove a result about semi magic squares in mathematics. All right, I want to focus on the non zero entry. So I'm just going to choose a non zero entry. I'll choose a three. All right. Now that three is not 13, which means that column has more non-zero entries in it. In fact, I'm just gonna go down the column until I find one. Oh, there we go, found one. There's a non-zero entry. That also can't be 13, because that was a number there. This can't be 13, otherwise that should have been zero. Okay, so I know I've got another number that's not 13. In fact, all the numbers I'm gonna be walking through are gonna be less than 13. In fact, this row is meant to add up to 30. So let me just walk across the row to and I hit another non-zero entry. Uh, oh, this is not 13, so it's column must have another non-zero entry in it. Here it goes. I'm going to walk up the column so I hit a non-zero entry. I'm going to keep alternating columns and rows, columns and rows, going from non-zero entry to non-zero entry. And I'll just keep doing it randomly. I'm just going this way. Maybe I'll go one all the way to the eight. And it seems like I could be doing this for a very long time. Well, I can't be doing infinitely long because there's only 16 numbers to walk around and eventually I have to repeat a number. In fact, I see right now I'm going to repeat that too which means I've just closed off a little loop. In fact, I can see the first start of my journey, three to that two, I don't need. I don't need that part, because if I get rid of that beginning part, I can see the rest of it is actually a loop. The rest of it is actually a loop. So what I've just proved there, essentially, is that in any semi-magic square, I could find a loop of non-zero entries. Great. Loops of non-zero entries exist in semi-magic squares. Next step. I want to really focus on these non-zero entries. And what I'm going to do is something very strange. I want to see if I can get some more zeros in this particular pattern. I want to keep the zeros I already have and just introduce more and more zeros. I want to turn some non-zero entries into zeros. Why? Well, this is, this is how my brain is working. For example, I can see in this loop the smallest number I encountered was that 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that into a zero by saying, let's subtract 1 from that entry. Let me say I just ruin that row, because that's been to add up to 13. So to counteract that move, I'll add 1 to that entry. So that now still adds to 13. But now I've ruined that column. I added 1 to it, so let me subtract 1 there to counteract it. Which means I've ruined that row. I subtracted 1, so let me add 1 here. But I've ruined that column. Let me subtract 1 to counteract it. But I've ruined that row to add 1 there. I've ruined that column. Subtract 1 there. I've ruined that row. So add 1 there. And bingo. Bingo. So I'm going to say, actually, once I've identified a loop, I can find the smallest number in that loop, in this case is 1, and keep ordinarily subtracting and adding it all through that loop. And that'll give me a new array of numbers. In this case, 3, 6, 1, 3, uh, 1, 0, 12, 0, 0, uh, subtract 1 is 3, 0, 10, and 9, 4, 0, 0. I've got a new zero in the entry, in the, in the, uh, in the array. All right, magic sum is still 13 everywhere, and all the non-zero entries still match what were non-zero entries here. So I've preserved non-entries, I haven't created any new non-zero entries, but I have added extra zeros. I've got a technique now to add extra zeros and keep non-zero entries where they are. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, do it again. Add some more zeros to that. Do it again. Add some more zeros to that. Keep doing that loop game. Find a loop. Just walk a loop from alternating rows and columns and then shifting by the smallest number. Oh, one again. All right, lots of ones. Okay, well, ones. Ones will work. Over and over again. Keep creating more zeros until you can find no more loops amongst the non-zero entries. And what's it going to be? How do you not find any loops? Well, the way you will not find any loops is if this sort of thing happened. Maybe I had, oh, numbers that weren't smaller than 13. Every number I see is going to be 13. Every non-zero number I see is going to be 13. Maybe I'll get something like this. Whoa. So this game I was playing, walking the loops and adjusting numbers, only kept adding more zeros. I never created new non-zero numbers. So where these 13 are, these 13s are, and the final result here, I can't walk any more loops, must correspond to positions that were actually still non-zero numbers in the original matrix. In fact, I think they're the ones I first chose. That position, this position, this position, and this position. Which means, oh, there's a method for me to identify four non-zero numbers, one per row, one per column in the original matrix. Now I know, say, one card there, one card there, one card there, one card there. And then I can repeat the idea for the next semi-magic magic matrix with magic sum 12. And then repeat the idea for the next semi-magic ma semi -magic matrix with magic sum 11 and 10 and 9 all the way down to 0. 
We have just proven a very big result in mathematics. It's actually a version of something called the uh, Birkhoff von Neumann theorem about double st stochastic matrices, but usually they prove it with a very advanced uh, result, another result called Hall's matching theorem. But here, you actually, if you're playing with non negative integers, you actually kind of see this little loop game of walking around paths. It's kind of neat and it gets you there. It gets you there. It's not the most efficient method of finding a path to do it. We've now proven yes, you will always be able to select one card of each suit from four separate piles and do it over and over and over again. And when we do the 13 pile case of four cards each, you'll be doing a big 13 by 13 array with every row adding up to four and every pile, every column adding up to four. And if you do it four times in a row by playing this loop technique, and you will find four uh, a path to actually solve that solitaire puzzle of sitting one card of each number from 13 different piles. You can see it actually is kind of worth your while to actually write it out one time to make sure you understand this, this method. It's tedious, but it will do the trick and you'll get there. Grand, grand. So we've just proven a big result about semi-magic squares. To be formal with our language, if you like, uh, arrays like this are usually called matrices, and we can define a semi-magic matrix to be a square matrix uh, with non-negative integer values, such as all the rows and all the columns of that matrix sum to the same value a magic sum M of some kind. And we've just proven actually that every semi-magic matrix actually can be broken down as a sum of permutation matrices, individual semi-magic matrices with magic sum one. Uh, these are called permutation matrices because they actually are like permutations of all the columns of the identity matrix. In fact, this one has magic sum 13, and it's a sum of 13 permutation matrices. Two of these ones, one of those ones, three of those, five of those, and two of those. Wow. Every semi-magic matrix is a sum of permutation matrices. Actually, semi-magic matrices are lots of fun. Let me clean the board and show you something really cool about them. All right, for those really comfortable with matrix theory, here's something really cool and wild. Suppose you've got two matrices of the same size, two n by n matrices A and B that are both semi-magic. Uh, maybe one has sum M, one has magic sum N. Um, let's do the basic matrix operations on them. If you do so, you'll find that their sum A plus B is also a semi-magic matrix. Uh, and it has magic sum M plus N. Uh, the difference is also semi-magic with magic sum M minus N. And those ones you probably might be able to see in your mind's eye. Uh, if you multiply matrix by scalar, semi-magic matrix by scalar, it is still semi-magic. Uh, if you take the transpose, this one with all the basic operations of a semi-magic matrix, it is still semi-magic. Now oh, that one's not too bad. Um, but what gets freaky when you start looking at things like the matrix product? The matrix product of two semi-magic matrices is again semi-magic. And can you guess what its magic sum is going to be? And here's why it gets really freaky. If the inverse of a semi-magic matrix happens to exist, then its inverse is also semi-magic. And I wonder what its magic sum is going to be. Whoa, whoa, grand stuff. Okay, this is all pretty hard to prove if you think about sums of permutation matrices, but here's a better way to think about it. Here's a lovely definition of a matrix being semi-magic in terms of matrix operations. Let J be um, the matrix all of whose entries are one. Every single entry from all the way through rows, top to the bottom row, all the way across is one, 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 one. Then you can argue that a matrix A is semi-magic if only if A times this matrix J is a copy, a scaled copy of J and the other way around, J times A. This gets all the row sums equal M, this means all the column sums equal M, or maybe we've got it backwards. This is actually a lovely definition of a matrix being, being semi-magic, in which case, once you've got that under your belt, maybe these are possible to prove with some ease now. Lovely stuff, go love those semi-magic matrices, and they have lots of cool applications in very strange ways. No doubt I'll be making videos about more applications of this lovely result about semi-magic matrices.